Amen to all of that. Thank you to those who have led us in worship. Um, that was quite a, a time of worship this evening. This is one of those moments in which I, I, I'm tempted to dismiss us without preaching. I won't, but I'm tempted uh, because everything that I am going to preach, we have already lifted up in song. As we now turn our attention to the Word of God, if you join me in another moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, we are thankful um, that we made the commitment, we made the effort to gather here and worship you. We're so thankful that we've encountered you in this place uh, among our brothers and sisters in the Lord. As we open up your word and we read it and meditate upon it, we pray for the ears to hear. Your word is capable of piercing us and judging the thoughts and the attitudes of our heart. We invite that to happen now. May your spirit lead us to truth. May, may your spirit convict us of both sin and truth. May this time in your word shape us. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Our passage for this Sunday evening series is serving as a trip to the heart doctor. The words of Jesus in this parable function as an EKG through a story about dirt. Jesus speaks to the condition of of our hearts. That's right. Through a through words, through a story, through a parable about dirt. Jesus speaks to the condition of our hearts. What is the condition of your heart? In the first week in this series, I, I did an overview of all the heart conditions we see in this parable. Last week, we, we put a laser focus on the hard heart. And for this evening, our focus is upon the shallow heart. We read Matthew 13, 1 through 9 earlier in our service. We now come to Jesus' explanation of the parable. Uh, in verse 18, Matthew 13, 18. If you're ready to hear the word of God, can I hear a big, loud amen? amen. Uh, if you're still flipping there, I, I hear people uh, still flipping. By all means, make your way to Matthew 13, verse 18. I'll, I'll just add one thing. There, there has been a, a bit of story, a bit of narrative that has happened since we left off in verse 9. Jesus tells the parable. Um, then in verse 10, a, a smaller group comes to Jesus and says, why do you speak to the people in parables? I, I see this smaller group as the spiritually hungry ones. They want to know a bit more. They step in. They lean in a little closer. And then Jesus goes on to say, you know, this is actually a fulfillment of prophecy. And then Jesus goes on to quote a, a little bit of Isaiah. He says, you'll be hearing but never understanding and never perceiving. For, get this, in 1315, for this people's heart has become calloused. Oh, this, this is... This is a story about the heart, not, not soil. This is truly about our hearts. They hardly hear with their ears and they have their eyes closed. Otherwise, they might see with their ears and hear with their ears, understand with their hearts, 
and turn, and I would heal them. Oh, Jesus tells a parable. Some that are spiritually hungry lean in and want a little more, and he goes, oh, this is not about dirt. This is about your heart. And then in verse 18, he gives them this explanation. Listen then to what the parable of the sower means. When anyone hears the message about the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what was sown in their heart. This is the seed sown along the path. The seed falling on rocky ground refers to someone who hears the words, word and at once receives it with joy, but since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. The seed falling among the thorns refers to someone who hears the word, but the worries of this life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. But the seed falling on good soil refers to someone who hears the word and understands it. This is the one who produces a crop yielding 160 or 30 times what was sown. We've looked at an overview of all of the heart conditions presented by Jesus in this parable. We've focused in on the hard heart, and tonight our laser focus is upon the shallow heart. So I begin with a familiar question. Do you have a shallow heart? Jesus encountered shallow hearts, and shallow hearts are a dime a dozen today. In the telling of the parable that we read earlier in the service, the shallow heart is described in verses 5 and 6. It's this seed that is thrown onto rocky places. And that the plants actually grow up. They they actually shoot up. They actually pop up quickly. But then they're killed by the the sun because they have no roots. As we just saw a moment ago, Jesus comes back to the telling of the parable. He he addresses the shallow heart. He he gives a spiritual meaning, and he says this shallow heart is one who hears the Word. They hear it. They actually receive it with great joy. But they quickly fall away. Jesus, in the deeper spiritual meaning of the telling of the parable, says uh, these, the the shallow hearts, the shallow-hearted people, they receive with great joy. But then when trouble comes, when, when persecution comes, they turn and walk away. They turn and run in the opposite direction. Why? Because they had no roots. Their their heart was shallow. So in each sermon in this series, I'm asking that question, um, asking you to look inside your own heart as the specific heart condition we're looking at. Uh, ask the question, do you have a, a shallow heart? And then I attempt to give a reason what causes that particular heart condition. And then we try to look through the Bible to, to uncover how, how, how God can change our hearts. So, so do you have a Shallow heart, uh, why, what, what causes that? What, what causes a shallow heart? I would tell you that shallow hearts lack discipleship. That's what causes a, a shallow heart, a lack 
of discipleship, an absence of discipleship. A lot of this will, will sound familiar to you. Um, these original disciples, when we open up our Bible, these original disciples responded to this invitation provided to them by Jesus. Come, follow me. And in that process of following Jesus, that they are taught and instructed. They are corrected and rebuked. And I see it as a master class, a discipleship 101 where they are shaped, they are molded, they are transformed, they are given hands-on experience that deepens their faith. It is this process of discipleship 101, this process of being um, taught and instructed and corrected and rebuked that, that allows their deep, for deep roots it's through this process, discipleship of one-on-one, of being taught and instructed, corrected and rebuked, that they see that Jesus is bigger and better than anything or anyone else. And I want us in our time this evening to... to take a look at Discipleship 101. Something I often say is uh, we, we should learn from mistakes. We also should know that we don't have to learn from our mistakes. We can look around us and see the mistakes made by other people and learn from their mistakes. The Gospels provide that for us. Um, Last number of months, um, I've continued to be gripped by the gospel of Mark. It's our shortest gospel. In many ways, it does highlight discipleship 101. When you compare Mark to the other gospels, Mark is um, a bit hard on the disciples. Um, he, he does give us many of their highlights, but, but he tends uh, to also be one to give us plenty of low lights. Uh, many other preachers have said that in Mark's gospel, uh, the disciples at many times appear to be the disciples. We can learn from their highlights and their low lights. Seeing their low lights, actually, I think, perhaps for us this evening, makes it easier for us to step into their sandals. So, I, I promise this is going to move quicker than it's going to sound at first. I'm mindful. I see three clocks right in front of me. But very quickly, we're going to go through the entire Gospel of Mark. I promise it's very quickly. If you sense me beginning to tarry in a certain spot, you all have permission to give me a wrap it up, and I can keep moving here. But so, but the purpose here is uh, uh, we're talking about a heart condition. Jesus explains there, there's people, there's shallow-hearted people who receive the word. They receive it with great joy. And then when trouble comes, persecution comes, they run the opposite direction. We, we are here tonight examining all, our own heart, allowing God through his word to examine our heart. Are we ones of shallow hearts? Well, what causes a, a shallow heart? Well, a lack of discipleship. So I, I want to run through very quickly the gospel of Mark to look at this Discipleship 101. So I invite you to, it's going to be very hard if you read your Bible on your phone. Um, but I, I think you could manage. But if you've got a Bible in front of you, plop it open to the book of Mark. And I'm going to quickly highlight a few passages as we look at this Discipleship 101, the very beginning of Mark. And I promise you, this is going to go quick. This will go quickly. 
Mark chapter 1, we'll take a look at verse 16, a very familiar passage to you. Mark 1, 16, as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Verse 17, come, follow me, Jesus said, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and followed him. The disciples are called. And I'm often amazed at how often we miss that at the very beginning of our Gospels, at the very moment that these original disciples are called, they are called for a purpose. And they're told at the outset, Jesus is saying, you are going to follow me in order for me to mold and shape you to be ones who make more disciples. You you once fished for fish, and now I'm going to mold you and shape you to be one who can fish for people. That's the purpose they're given at the very beginning. See, shallow hearts... They follow Jesus for the benefits. His shallow hearts say, I'll take the good things that Jesus provides, right? Sign me up. If there's blessings, if there's perks, I'll take them. If I could get a little peace, a little comfort, if I could get a little guilt removed, I'll take it. Sign me up. Disciples. On the other hand, Jesus expects disciples not to merely receive benefits. But Jesus expects disciples to make more disciples. We See right there, that would have been a good point. That went a little long, right? A little longer than I expected. You could have given me the, let's hurry this one up here. We're going through the whole gospel. All right, so I'm going to need your your help here. You fast forward a little bit. Mark 1, verse 35, very early in the morning while it was still dark, Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. And as is often is the case in the gospel of Mark, Mark loves to provide comparisons. So here you see Jesus getting up early. It's still dark. He goes off and he prays, goes to a solitary place. He's trying to be alone. Verse 36, Simon and his companions went out to look for him. And when they found him, they exclaimed, everyone is looking for you. You see, you, you, you read this, and Discipleship 101. Remember the, the purpose of this? We're going through it. It's in this Discipleship 101. These disciples are being taught and instructed. They're being corrected and rebuked. They're, they're learning to see that Jesus is bigger and better than anything or anyone else. And here, they, they see Jesus modeling prayer. They see, they see Jesus seeking the face of God. Now, shallow-hearted people, They seek their own personal desires. They they, they receive the Word of God with great joy because they think it provides benefit. They sign me up. But once it begins to interfere with their personal desires, they turn and run. Disciples, on the other hand, seek the will of God. We keep moving forward. Fast forward through Mark chapter 2. We'll we'll land in Mark chapter 3, verse 13. You've been hearing me reference this passage a number of times in recent days because God is using it to to work in my own heart. Mark 3, 13. Jesus went up on a mountainside and called to him those he wanted, and they came to him, and he appointed twelve that they might be with him, that he might send them out to preach and to have authority to drive out demons. And so here you, the, it's emphasized once again, these, these disciples have been called, and they've been called for the purpose that God is going to use them. Jesus will actually send them out. 
Now remember, we're, we're comparing this to Matthew 13 and shallow-hearted people. Shallow hearts don't like work. They just want the benefits. Disciples are sent to do the work and the will of God. Keep moving with me. We go into uh, Mark chapter 4. I promise you this is front-loaded. We won't go through it this closely all the way through, but we're, we're making good time. Mark chapter 4, uh, beginning in verse 35, is, is a passage of Scripture I love. The, the disciples are on a boat, and a storm hits, and these disciples are fearful that they will die. After they've panicked enough, after they've stressed and worried long enough, they go and wake Jesus up. And Jesus, who was asleep on a cushion, says, peace be still, and the waves die down. Now, shallow hearts, Remember when trouble and persecution comes, they run away. The shallow heart person doesn't stay in the boat long enough to engage Jesus. They turn and run. They don't engage Jesus. They say, Jesus, help us. What I love about this story is the disciples don't have it all figured out. If you read the entirety of this story... Uh, verse 41, the disciples, they were terrified and asked each other, who is this? Even the wind and the waves obey him. This is another aspect of discipleship 101. These disciples don't have it all figured out. But because they continue to follow, they've just had their eyes opened a bit more. The shallow hearts didn't make it there. The disciples continued to press in, continued to engage. They didn't have it all figured out, but their eyes were open just a bit more. Mark 6. And let's jump to Mark 6. Uh, we'll put it, uh, we'll, we'll land in verse 6. If your Bible is like mine at Mark 6, 6. <laughs> A, a section heading actually cuts a verse in half. Uh, looking at the second half of Mark 6, 6. And then Jesus went around teaching from village to village, calling the twelve to him. He began to send them out. Here we go. They're, they're getting sent out on mission. Sends them out two by two, and he gave them authority over impure spirits. And these were his instructions. Take nothing for the journey except a, a staff. No bread, no bag, no m money in your belts. Wear sandals, but not an extra shirt. And whenever you enter a house, stay there until uh, you, you leave that town. If any place will not welcome you or listen to you, leave that place and shake the dust off your feet as a testimony against them. And then in verse 12, they actually went out and preached that people should repent. They actually do it. They've been following Jesus. He's been molding and, and shaping them. He's been instructing and correcting and teaching and rebuking. And now he's actually sending them out. He actually gives them quite the instructions in this instance. I, I'm sending you out, but take nothing with you. Shallow-hearted people, not having any part of that. Too big of a task, too hard of a task. But disciples, they've been engaged long enough and hard enough, they've been shaped enough that they say, I'll do it. They don't take anything with them, but they depend upon God. We stay in that chapter very quickly. We, we go to verse 30. I won't read it for you. This is the famous feeding of the 5,000 passage. 
Again, this is one of those passages that we know the story, but I think we often breeze past the details here. This is one of those instances. The large crowd has gathered once again. Jesus has been teaching. They realize that it's late, and there's a lot of people, and they're hungry. Some of the disciples become, come to Jesus, and they say, what are we going to do about this? And Jesus looks at them and says, no, what are you going to do about this? What are you going to do about this? You, you know the story. Jesus eventually takes the, the little that was collected and he offers up thanks to God and he, he multiplies it. And then what does he do? He puts it into the hands of the disciples. You feed them. Shallow hearted people, they don't like going hungry. I'm not going to listen to a teaching. It's so long that I get hungry. Don't like hunger. Don't like long lines. But, but disciples, because they're pressed in, because they're leaning in, they, they get, out of the grace of God, get to play a role in the work of God. Would move towards uh, Mark chapter 8, verse 31. Mark 8, 31. You still with me? Can I hear an amen? Just a few more, I promise. Mark 8, 31. Uh, I'll read this because we need to grasp this. Mark 8, 31. Uh, he, this is Jesus. Jesus then began to teach them that the Son of Man, that was Jesus' favorite name for himself, must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders and chief priests and the teachers of the law and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. When Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God but merely human concerns. Again, Discipleship 101. Jesus is teaching and instructing, correcting and rebuking. Here Jesus is telling. He, he's speaking plainly about his coming betrayal and crucifixion and resurrection. And Peter actually rebukes Jesus. And then for the purpose of the other disciples, don't you love how, how Jesus turns and he makes sure Peter hears it and then he makes sure everybody else hears it. He goes, no, I'm headed to the cross. And then Jesus goes on to explain to them that if I'm headed to the cross, the cross might be in your future as well. Now, you see, shallow hearts want no part of a cross. They say, now, okay, I'll take you calming my storms. I'll take you feeding me some bread. But don't give me a cross. Peter, even though he gets it wrong here, yet again, his eyes are opened. It's in this process of following Jesus. It's in the process of continuing to follow that disciples see that Jesus is bigger and better than anything or anyone else. I'll jump to the end. Mark 16. Mark 16. Mark 16 begins when the Sabbath was over. Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James, and Salome brought spices so they might go to anoint Jesus' body. 
the Gospels often give us these little snapshots into groups of women that continually follow Jesus. And here they are. Jesus has been to the cross of which he foretold. He's been raised from the dead. And this group of women, they have not turned. They have not run away. They have stayed faithful to the very end. And what's in store for them? They get to see an empty tomb. They get to be the proclaimers of the good news. And they get to be the first to run out and preach the Easter message. The tomb is empty. Jesus is alive. You see, shallow hearts, they turn and run. But, but disciples, they see that Jesus is bigger and better than anything or anyone else. So what causes a shallow heart? It's a lack of discipleship. If they stayed, they remained, they would see the power of Jesus sprinting to the finish. In a, in a recent sermon, I, I shared the characteristics of a disciple, and we've discussed shallow-hearted, and I've compared that a bit, but disciples, if I could pin it into three words, uh, uh, disciples are devoted, developing, and deployed. Disciples are devoted. I asked the question tonight, are you devoted to Jesus? Do you know that in Jesus there is abundant life and eternal life? Do you know that Jesus is bigger and better than anything or anyone else. And disciples are, are developing. I like that listed as a gerund, an I-N-G, because this is a continual process. As we just saw running through the gospel, disciples are continually in the process of developing the character of Jesus. And, and at the same time, we're continually in the process of developing the competencies of Jesus. We saw this through the gospel. They're following him, and he's molding and shaping them, instructing and uh, correcting and rebuking, and then he actually sends them out to do the work. And then disciples are deployed. We are sent out on mission. We are deployed on a mission to make more disciples. Jesus encountered shallow hearts. And shallow hearts are a dime a dozen today. Check your heart. Better yet, allow God to examine your heart. And as you look in, do you see symptoms? Do you see symptoms of a lack of discipleship? If you do, don't turn and run. Rather, run toward Jesus. He will embrace you and offer you that invitation yet again. Come, follow me. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are thankful that you allow sinners like us to follow you, and that you allow sinners like the ones gathered in this room and turn, tuned into this broadcast. You, you allow us to be a part of your church. May we be faithful in following you, and may we be faithful to the call to make more disciples. 
Father, if, if we are shallow-hearted, we pray for deep roots. If we are shallow-hearted, we, we ask that in your grace and in your power, you would draw us to your side. May we see you for who you are. May we see our need for you, our dependence upon you. May that be reflected in everything we do. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. We'll conclude tonight with a song. I know for those guys.